you don't know what is going on right now, you know. Um, uh, I am um, most thankful uh, for uh, Esther Johnson, Elder Preddy, and the church family for your support of Mark, uh, Eve's adopted son, and Faye, her sister, who was by Eve's side on even the last moments. Uh, and, and so on behalf of all the family members and friends, I want to thank the church family for just being such an incredible church family to Sister Eve, who we called Elder Eve, and many of us called her Mother Eve. So I just wanted to share my indebtedness to you for what you have done for her. I want to, I'm humble that Pastor Chris, affectionately known as Pastor Chris, would allow me to have this time and and um, allow me to borrow his pulpit for a moment. Um, I can see there's nothing that thrills you more than going to a church where you once served and seeing the church thousand times better than how you left it, you know? So I just wanted to thank the church family and bring, bring, bring greetings to all of you on behalf of my family. It was 2002, I was just 33, mercy. I was a single man and I came to this church and this church blessed us so much. I got married here. I had three of my daughters dedicated and I left 2013. At the time, Hannah was just six years old and Rebecca was just three and Isabella was just two. And they came to me yesterday and said, oh, we don't know what to say. It seems like they know all of us, but we don't know them. <laughs> but you know, I want you to know that this is where everything started. And I hope that you will feel this is what church is all about. Amen. Uh, there is a one name that I will never be able to forget. That is Zenda Thompson. Is she? She passed? She's residing in Guelph. Oh, she's residing in Guelph. So let me tell you a little bit story of why I cannot forget this name, Zenda Thompson. I came here, but God did not give me the, the brain that remembers names. So I'm horrible, Sister Cheryl. By the way, thank you for that beautiful singing. Now I know where Sabone, Serion, and Sean Anthony got their singing voice from. So you know, Sister, that I am horrible in remembering names. So I preached my sermon and I was standing at the door. Everyone was passing by. I said, good to see you, sister. Good to see you, brother. And Sister Zenda Thompson stood in front of me, tall, and she said, Pastor, what is my name? <laughs> I'm like, <clears throat> okay. oh, you know, I, yeah, just, just, can you just give me first letter, you know, something? Give me something so that I will be able to remember. But she said, no, what is my name? And so I learned a lesson that day. This name I shall never forget. Right? But please don't put me on the spot today. But I know most of your names, but I'm getting old too. I return to you as a 55-year-old man. And if you have a husband who's 55, you know what I'm talking about. So be gracious to me. But I trust that even though um, it just... I wasn't planning to share the message with you. I pray that maybe there is reason why uh, God has allowed me to stand before you. But before I say anything, I want to, to say this. I always wanted to say this, that I just want to thank you for your forbearance and putting up with me for 15 years. And, you know, I know that some of you may remember some of the good things that happen, but I know that during my ministry tenure that I've hurt some of you. So allow me to take this opportunity to tell you from the bottom of my heart, I didn't know then. I was still too young. I'm still young at heart, but I am mature enough to know that, you know, there are certain things that we pastors do unintentionally out of the desire to advance the work of God. But that does not, does, just, does not justify, you know, leaving behind members whose hearts are broken. 
So if I have played a part in making your Christian journey a difficult one, I ask for your forgiveness as I ask you to look up the cross. Amen? Amen. I'm a broken man. I'm standing here as a humble servant. So with that, would you join me in prayer as we study the Word of God? Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, as we open your word, open our eyes that we may see you. Open our ears that we may hear your voice. Open our minds that we may understand the wonderful plans that you have for us. But most importantly, open our hearts that at the end we will receive you into our hearts, that you be our Lord and King. This is our prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So the scripture reading, thank you, Brother David, for reading that. And you know what? Um, I, I continue to affirm you, the Kitchener Waterloo Church family, for doing the one sure thing of church growth, is having as many babies as possible and keeping them in the church. Amen? And you know, soon, soon, you will reach a maximum capacity and you will start thinking about expanding church. There's nothing that is more you know, exciting than that. So the passage that I read is from Exodus chapter 17, verse 8. Exodus chapter 17, verse 8. So it says, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in the Rephidim. Just trying to bring some context. Amalekites were descendants of Esau's grandson. Israelites are descendants of who? Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel, right? So now we're talking about Jacob and his older brother Esau. You know, there were a little bit of a dynamics, you know that, regarding the birthrights and whatnot. And then Esau had a grandson, and he's called Amalek. And the descendants of Jacob, they became Israelites. But however, they were not getting along well. In fact, Amalekites didn't like Israelites at all. So every opportunity that they had, they'll try to attack Israelites. Just as the followers of the devil cannot stand the followers of God, and every opportunity there is, the descendants of evil will try to attack the descendants of God's people. Amen? So here we see a situation where Amalekites are making Israelites' life miserable. So now, and Moses said to Joshua, here the name Joshua appears for the first time in this narrative. You know, we know that Joshua was the successor of Moses. His name, Joshua, was not always Joshua. In fact, his name was changed from Hosea. His name was changed from Hosea to Joshua. But we'll go, you know, we'll get to that a little bit later. The word Joshua means Jehovah is salvation or Jehovah helps. The name Joshua was actually given to him by Moses. Moses was the one who, as he was calling him to step up to the leadership position as a successor of Moses, he gave him a new name, and that was Joshua, which means Jehovah is salvation, or Jehovah helps. But before that, his name was Hosea, or Hosea, which means salvation. Salvation, and that was his name. But however, what happened? Moses added one name to his name that changed everything. That name was Jehovah. Jehovah is salvation. Your name is not just salvation, but your name now is Jehovah is salvation or Jehovah helps. So, now in this instance, the Amalekites were really cowardish. Usually, as you are proceeding with your clan, if I may, 
you know, to avoid the weak ones, the vulnerable ones, the children, the elderly people from in harm's way, they would put the strong men in front. They'll put strong men in front so that if there's any adversaries coming on their way, the men will protect their families, especially the vulnerable ones, little ones, elderly ones. But this occasion, Amalekites devised a plan and that was so cowardish, and instead of just facing them, they sneaked behind them and started attacking those vulnerable ones. So God's patience ran out, even though God withdrew his hands of protection because of the Israelites' evil ways, and they chose to be disobedient to God. And for that reason, God withdrew his protection. But even then, in God's mercy, even though the people chose to depart from him, but when the adversaries were attacking the vulnerable, vulnerable ones, God said, this is not going to be tolerated. This is the kind of merciful God that I serve. So he impressed Moses to go and talk to Joshua and say, you know, I have a plan to deliver your people from this situation. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some man and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Unfortunately, the report, by the time the report came to him, it was too late. The damage was already done. There were already casualties. So he said, tomorrow, a new day, a new start of a day, we are going to go after them. So now Joshua verse 10 Joshua did as Moses said to him, and fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur, and Hur is none other than someone who's married to Miriam, so he is the brother-in-law of Moses. So, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill where they could see battle taking place before their eyes. And so it was when Moses held up his hand and that was his supplication, his prayer, his asking God's intervention, his asking God's help. And here the leader was pleading with God, Sister Vanessa. I believe the reason why we are feeling this energy, positive Holy Spirit energy in this church is someone and people are doing the right things. I wouldn't be surprised that you have spent many hours praying together. I wouldn't be surprised that the word of God was spoken from this pulpit. Amen. Pastor, you only have six more years to go. <laughs> then you would have served this church 12 years. But if he doesn't plan to stay only after 12. He said he wants to stay until Jesus comes. Amen. And I hope Jesus comes soon. You know, praise the Lord. Amen. So I can sense that the intentionality of a leader here, Moses, he recognized the source of power is not within him. He realized in his experience and his humbled experience, can you imagine when he was 40 years old, when he received the royal training, he was treated like a prince. Everybody told him that he's going to become the next king. Imagine dealing with a guy 40 years old, received the best, he had the best, and he thinks he is the best. Lord have mercy. And God humbled him through the wilderness experience for 40 years. And finally he said, what? I can't do anything. And God said, now you get it. If you realize you can't do anything, now I can make use of you. So he started recognizing that the power comes from God, not from himself. And here he finds teaching his successor the most important lesson. That is, Hosea, let me add another element into your life. Your name is salvation. Very good name. But let me add another one, Joshua, to it. So you will know that salvation does not happen alone. But salvation happens when you trust God and when you depend on him. So here for the first time, Joshua is learning from his own experience of fighting the battle, and he called Joshua to come out. And when Joshua came out, and as they were all watching, and Joshua was fighting, Moses held up his hand, and that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So he was praying, but Aaron and Hur started to notice that 
Every time his hand was lifted up, it seems like Israelites are forcing their enemies further and further back. But whenever his hand came down, they could see their enemies attacking and seeing Israelites you know, withdrawing. So they figured very quickly that his lifting of hand had something to do with the situation that they were experiencing. But the point is, it was not just the hand that was lifted, but there was something in that hand. There was something that was in that hand. Now verse 12, But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. When Aaron and her saw that something spiritual is happening, something divine is happening, and even though his hand is the hand that was holding this rod, lifting it up, they soon figured it out that this act of lifting this standard or this rod has something to do with their victory, and they soon realized we better assist him and make sure his hand do not, does not come down and we will support. Amen. You know, I'm preaching this sermon to myself. You know, I'm not, you could use this sermon in two ways, right? Um, Brother Dillian, you could say, well, you should support Moses, right? Okay, you get it? But I'm not going to focus on that because I'm going to focus on my shortcomings. I'm talking about me. And I apologize to you. Sometimes I wonder whether I stand in the way of people discovering Jesus. Sometimes I wonder whether I am a channel of God's grace coming through me, or am I hindering people from seeing God because there's just too much G1. There's just too much G1. The emphasis here is that they recognized that in the hand of Moses was the rod that represent. And they realized what Moses was doing was he was interceding on people's behalf and they saw that he was connected with God and he is able to solicit the power of God and as he was interceding on behalf of people, they realized that Moses was God sent. And as he is pleading with God, they need to partner with him and cooperate with him. What a beautiful scene that was. You know, I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired of watching news. I haven't actually watched news for two, three years. I used to be a news junkie. I could spend two, three, four hours watching CNN, and some people think I should watch Fox or whatever. If you don't know what those news stations are, Fox station represents conservatives, and then and CNN, some people think, is a liberal medium and whatnot. But I'm sick and tired of the world divided in two extremes. I'm not just talking about the political arena, but we are also witnessing that happening in very own congregations of our own churches. People are having liberal opinions and people are having conservative opinions. And I'm sometimes wondering, do you even know, do you even care what is God's principles? What if you just stop doing whatever you're doing from each or both sides? I'm sick and tired of this. But at that moment, as they were fighting the battle, today we're fighting the spiritual battle between good and evil. Have you sensed it? Do you recognize that it seems like you're dealing with the principles of evil rather than an individual? When you're trying to do something right, do you feel that you're not dealing with a person, but you are dealing with the whole region of evil? Do you not sense that? Do you not sense that we're fighting the spiritual battle today? Because perhaps Jesus is ready to come. And the devil knows that his time is limited. And he is trying to do his scary, 
crafty, sly, the low, whatever method that he's trying to do to hurt our children, to hurt our relatives, to hurt our elderly, to hurt our families, trying to break our family bond, trying to break our church family. And he's doing all these things. He's doing all these things. But how wonderful it is. At this one moment, they realize their well-being, their life, that your life is in peril, and they realize we need to come together. If there's a time such as that, now is the time. We need to come together and recognize that we are living the last moments of this world. And we must, we must come together. But how beautiful of a scene this was that Moses, this tired man, this elderly man whose hand was so weary, but yet he desired to lift his hand up and try to keep the rod. But he is just a human, and he's just a human. Even though he wanted to uphold the principles of God, he was just a man like you and me, and his hand grew tired. But thankfully, there were other godly men around him who recognized that he was lifting up God's principles. And when they came in support of his arm, and when they held their hands together, they were victorious. So the Bible says, So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. The battle that we're fighting even though we are fighting, we're feeling the action of this great controversy. Let me tell you, this is the fight between the originator of evil and the originator of good. And I am so thankful I could say and make a statement that good has already claimed victory. Amen. And Moses built an altar and call its name Jehovah Nisi. Yahweh Nisi. The Lord is my banner. Amen. The banner is something that when you are going to fight, to rally your soldiers, they will parade it. They will show it. And, 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 and as the, the, um, the, the, the horses and, you know, Soldiers, you know, marched forward, advanced forward. They lift those banners up. You know, I would like to invite you to turn your Bible to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And we know this chapter very well because of John chapter 3, 16. Here is a story of a new birth that was taking place in the life of Nicodemus. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, There was a man of Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, came. And verse 2, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with us, with him. Jesus answered him and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is why we get baptized. There's no better choice that you can make in this world than choosing to follow Jesus. So young people, consider a great privilege when you are able to be in there led by Pastor Johnson and you are making that choice that you've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus. When I look at this section, that is youth section. That is youth section, but I see that youth section has spilled into the other section as well. That's a good sign. That is a good sign. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said this to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. 
So is everyone who is born of the Spirit? Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most surely I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Now we're talking about new birth. How many of you wish to have a new birth? How many of you want to experience a revival spiritual walk with Jesus? None of those mediocrity or Laodicean tendencies that you seem to be confused whether you belong to this world, but you belong to heavenly home, which is to happen. You know, while you are trying to decide, I know that we all have that desire, and that desire is we want to do it right. We want to have a new birth experience, born again experience. So Nicodemus was inquiring, and I hope you're also inquiring, Pastor, how can we be born again? How can we experience born again experience as a family, as an individual, as a church family, as a community, so and, and so forth? Now, this is him, Jesus, trying to persuade this young man. Who wants to do it right, but he's still trying to figure out how to do it. So finally, Jesus said, okay, let me give you an example that everyone knows, and you should know this. And that's verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What do you think Moses was lifting in his hand? You know, that is the rod. You know, I don't know whether that rod was used to put this brazen serpent before that incident or later, but that rod, I have no doubt in my mind, you know, represented the power and authority of Jesus. I'm sure that was a rod that was used to depart the sea. I wouldn't be surprised that was a rod that signaled the authority of God. The power didn't come from Moses, but they recognized the rod as the what? The very thing that came from God representing the power and the authority of God. And now he's saying to this young man, well-meaning young man, you want to be born again? If you want to have a change of life, you want to experience a newness in your life, I will tell you, just as you remember from your history lessons, just as when Israelites in the wilderness bitten by snakes, serpents, just as we've been bitten by the serpents of evil and we are succumbed to the toxicity of the venom that has been infiltrated into our DNA because we are sinners and we are dying of sin. Just as those rebellious, disobedient Israelites who chose to be away from God and ask God to withdraw His protection they were now vulnerable, exposed to the elements of the world, just as you and I, we've been exposed to the elements of the world. And as vulnerable, as sick as they were, as they were dying, what happened? They pleaded. They pleaded with Moses. And what did Moses do? Moses said, God instructed me to what? To put a brazen, brazen, brazen what? Serpent. So where did that bronze came from. Maybe bronze was used for a cup. Maybe bronze was used for a plate. Maybe brazen was used for other purposes. But when they realized that their eternal well-being, their, their physical well-being, their spiritual well-being was, were in peril, they realized those cups no matter. Those plates, eating every day, three times a day, the business of life and all that, didn't matter because they are dying. They're losing their eternal life. They're losing their eternal salvation. So what do they do? You know, of course, they offer those things as a, a, an offering to God, and they melted it together, and they form a serpent that's exemplified and same shape as a serpent that was beating. 
between, you know, biting them. I was wondering, Pastor Johnson, if I asked the church family, well, what do you want me to, what object do you want me to make of the rod? A, a, a lamb? Uh, and then place it on the, the rod that represents cross or a serpent? Serpent that is also synonymous to Satan, right? So then why serpent? Why not the lamb? Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that Jesus did not commit any sin, but he is the representative of all sins. Even though Jesus never committed one sin, he is the sinner who took my place so that I don't have to be crucified, but rather he took my place already and he died for me. So as Nicodemus was trying to understand, how can I be saved? How can I be saved? He's reminding them, have you forgotten the history lesson that you heard before? That they were all dying. If you are bitten by a venomous snake and you're dying, what can you do? What if God said to him, all right, okay, okay. So if you lift up your faces and look at that brazen serpent, you will be healed. However, that's too easy. So I'm going to give you some prerequisites. First, I want you to go and wash the wounds with holy water, whatever that is. I want you to take away the clothes that had stain of venom and blood. No. If you're hopeless, you're hopeless. If I'm helpless, I'm helpless. And as they were dying, feeling helplessness, hopelessness, Jesus said, there is still hope. There is still help. All you need to do is lift up your face and look at the source of power. And that is Jesus Christ. And Jesus was lifted up on the cross. When he died on the cross, he took you and my place. And we cannot continue this mediocrity. We cannot continue losing the battle between good and evil. We must come out of it victorious. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that does not happen accidentally. It will happen when the leader, Moses, when leader, G1, when leader, elders, so-and-so, when leader and the members desire to lift up God's banner, to lift up God's rod, to lift up God's principles. You know, God forbid, but sometimes we're living in a cynical world that sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, that even people of the word, the preachers of the word, we find ourselves, myself. Wait a minute, I know that if I preach this sermon, I'm going to offend some people. The moment when the word of God, as the preachers are delivering the word of God, make it more palatable to those listeners, maybe I should find a different job. God has sanctified this vocation called pastor, not to be a people pleaser, but become a representative of God. But I'm thankful that your church, this church, recognize that. And I can sense that your leaders are lifting up the banner of God, the rod of God. And we ought to do it. We have to make it obvious that we desire nothing more than lift up the word of God and uphold the principles of God. Man, I was looking at him, and I'm like, Dimitar. But that's not Dimitar. Dimitar's brother. I'm so glad. Look at how tall and how big he is. He was just little. But when they see their parents, when they see their church leaders, desiring nothing else but to do the will of God, as the word of God, the principles of God is lifted high that everyone can see. There will come the support of those around them. And you know, brothers and sisters, 
I think this world can use a few more Kitchener Waterloo churches. I think this church can use a few more Kitchener Waterloo church families. So, brothers and sisters, this is my humble submission. After over 20 years, a little more gray hair, being able to speak to my church family who we just fell in love with. Time is short. Very short. And it's my prayer that the Kitchener Waterloo Church will become the beacon of light in this community. That people will hear. If you want God's principles being applied, go to Kitchener Waterloo Church. And in so doing, there will be healing. There will be unity. There will be reconciliation. And there will be experience of heaven's richest blessing. So may God bless you, all of you. I may not remember your name, but I all remember your faces. <laughs> may God bless you. May God bless your children. So when time comes, when Jesus comes, we could say, Lord, here we are. We are part of the heavenly family, and we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, compared to the long sermons that I preached before, Maybe this is a relatively shorter sermon, even though some of you think that's a long sermon. So I ask that you will continue to pray for us. Let's pray for one another. May God bless the Kitchener Waterloo Church. May you bless many others. The world is in need of Christ, and you are to be the ambassadors of God to others. May God bless you. And this is my prayer. In Jesus' holy name.